What's up, everybody, and welcome to the Press X Podcast. Today, we are going to be going over our top 10 Xbox games. Uh, we've been doing these lists for multiple systems, and now we are on the Xbox, which is one I've been very excited for, um, mostly because, and I've talked about it before, our opinions are going to start varying quite a bit once we keep going backwards and mm-hmm. backwards, and you know, nostalgia and things play a role in, in these lists. So uh, just for clarity, this list is kind of a, oh, you bought an Xbox, here is 10 games I would recommend you purchase, and that's kind of the idea of it. We each have our own top 10 list. We give different point values to each one. Number 10 is worth one point. Number nine is worth two points, et cetera, all the way up to one being worth 10 points. We tally them up. We break some tiebreakers, and we get a top 10 list uh, as chosen by all of us. The rules are you cannot have more than one game from a particular series, so you can't have Knights of the Old Republic and Knights of the Old Republic 2, both on the same list. I'm (laughs) out. And uh, the game had to originally launch on the Xbox. Now, as we're getting into these past things, there's like games that launched on PC first and arcades first. That's okay. We're just limiting it to consoles to make it feel a little bit more special for that console, basically. Um but I think that's all the rules. I think I I think I nailed yep, it. You got it. And um, I think we all the first time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the first right try. For once. Um, <laughs> and I think we all bring our uh, like that's the limit to the rules. And then if you just want to do these are my top ten. This is the best ten on the system. Buy them. Or uh, some people might like throw some variants in there. It's just like uh, I, I want nine racing games and maybe something else or something like different awful. different mindsets going into yeah. it. Yeah, so I do I like have that part I do it. have some notes for it. Like I consider this a system that is interesting because I think it has good one player story driven mm. experiences and then it's other good thing is parties and it's kind of rare that that is how a yeah, system works by, but that's how i feel this particular and by works. parties uh this is different because i called i think it was the Wii that i called the party system this is like weekend party this is like hook four tvs four xboxes you do that system link since you the can't dominoes do guy is anymore. just making laps around oh, your there's neighborhood. A way. uh like this is like weekend land party mm-hmm. system so this is like the it's like the social system because yeah you can have like two or three friends over playing uh, like Smash or something like that. Like yeah. That's a good time. But you're probably already talking to those two or three people the whole week. This is like bringing a quarter of your high school class over and like the parents are gone sort of thing and just like everyone's just playing a game or something like that. So And this is when uh, internet gaming really kicked up on Xbox consoles. Xbox Live. Oh, yeah. Um, so sure. this is when it was just like, hey, I'm lonely and don't have any friends. Well... Here's a hundred person uh, friends list. Here you go. Uh, you can play with them and thousands of other people, uh, or you know, get all the people you used to play games with, and you don't have to drive to their house anymore. So, uh, with that said, I guess we can start off with our number tens. Uh, Kellen, I want to start with you this time. We're, we're gonna change it up a little bit. What okay. is your number ten? Uh, number ten, uh, Star Wars Jedi Knight Jedi Academy. Um, probably the most fun dueling game I've ever played, which is what we mostly talk about using it for, but it also had a pretty good campaign. It uh, definitely wasn't bad. It was definitely not bad. Um, it's the thing that was unique to me. I'd never seen it before was that you could do all the lightsaber dueling in the world and then walk outside and pick up a rifle and you would be a first person shooter. <laughs> yeah. It, it meshed that really well. I thought, um, the, the online dueling though thing was just fucking fantastic. Like, we spent way too much time doing that. It's it, it was a much more detailed version of rock, paper, scissors, or just trying to decide what to do, like, make a decision, and it's like, oh, I want to do this. Well, I want to do this. Let's settle it online. Yeah, I really enjoyed the um, kind of RPG stats mechanic of it, where you got yeah. a certain amount of points to spend, and you could either be light side or dark side, and you can either put it into like your saber skills, or you could put it into your force powers. Um, it adds a lot of replay value and variety, and those games, which were really probably most popular at this time, I think, where you make your own game variants. So it's like, all right, everybody has the push mechanic and the grab mechanic, and the only way you're allowed to kill people is throw them down the pit. Or in some other games, you do like cops and robbers type thing. Like This was kind of the people inventing their own game modes, basically. uh, Custom lobbies uh, is, I think, a theme that you'll see with a lot of games. Maybe I talk about, maybe all of us talk about. But yeah, this was... 
because like since I said it was like the origins of internet gaming on consoles and that's when they don't when developers don't think oh yeah we should have all these modes in here and stuff like that like people kind of have to come up with it first and then maybe in like the kind second try, third yeah. tenth yeah, inter- iteration of it they go well we'll put this in there it's like we can stream on this by putting it in the game yeah it also had a system like a multiplayer thing that I hadn't I hadn't seen anywhere else but Battlefield where you had like stages to the map the siege mode. It, yeah, I couldn't yeah. remember the name of it, but I used to love playing that because it, so it could take a while. So I don't know the answer to this. Can you system link siege mode? Because I agree that mode is incredible. Oh, I'm I used not to love sure it's it. playable anymore. Uh, I don't know. I've never. I don't tried know it. either. Don't know. But it is a cool mode. You're basically it's basically one team. Like you're attacking. Into it's attack and defending the, yeah. o- the other team, and like there's like mini bosses. Like you have to take down a rancor or whatever. You have to blow up all. Like, these like you're fighting through the it's, temple, and you got to do. It is yeah. definitely really neat and very unique. Um, a lot of fun too. Nick, yeah. what is your number ten? Number ten, sort of game that they uh, never really do for this type of system, and that usually is my tenth spot. Is like almost like an honorable mention. Yeah, almost. <laughs> yeah. Fusion Frenzy. Oh. Uh, Microsoft is not, even though we called it the party, and I mean like house party type system. They don't really have like party games in the essence of like Mario Party, something like that. Or just like even many like board game games that get made into um, like a full fledged video game. So I really like this game on not for just the fact that they did it, um, they took a chance on it, but also it's really fun. Um, they didn't just like copy and paste the Mario parties of the world, they put their own spin on it. Um, and they made basically just the Xbox version of what party games were like to them. So it was the same kind of system, but. It wasn't like roll the dice, move two ahead. It was just like competitive, competitive like arena type mini games, mm-hmm. which made it really fun and it really fit with the idea of online and stuff like that. Even though I don't think you could play it online, I don't think you. Could I don't either. think you could I the first two, one. There was maybe. a second one, yeah. But it, but it the made, second one's worse. It yeah, made it's like strictly use. Worse. It made use of hey, you're gonna have twenty people over at your house anyway. Here's a smash like type game where you're all running obstacles and doing these things and you know yeah. you can be the best of everyone. So if you want to take a break from the 20 hours of shooting, uh well here's a cool competitive game you can play and I like that. So it fits for me and that's why it's number 10. I like it. Uh my number 10 is The Suffering. So I am probably the only big uh survival horror guy here and The Suffering was a really unique survival horror game at the time and still. Um, it had it takes place in a prison, which is not a very common theme for survival horror. It's you play as this character who's very uh, gray with their uh, you know past, and depending on the choices you make, it shapes the game a little bit and it changes your ending. It's got kind of that like Mass Effect thing going for it. Um, you can you can you're in jail for murder basically, and you can maybe be framed or maybe you did murder and it's all depending on these decisions that you make and how many enemy like killing enemies and killing you can kill civilians and stuff like that uh but yeah it's got a prison theme to it which is just not a very common thing to see and it is definitely way more in the action uh horror than the survival camp uh you're it is a third person shooter uh, very much so it also did the thing where it had a sequel and you can actually load your save into the sequel and it oh. took your your choices and, and changed how uh, the the sequel played out but it was actually best on xbox which is not a well actually xbox playstation 2 it, it xbox graphically typically outdid and texture wise typically outdid the playstation 2 but this was a game that was best played on the Xbox and a just really solid survival horror game um, with a lot of shooting and really awesome. Like I think top notch uh, monster designs. They're very, very silent Hill, very creepy, very uh, based off of, you know, there's these prison theme to it. So they like, they have like shanks and things like that as kind of their, their motive for uh, attack. Um, Really neat game. Really like it. And kind of like you, I, I want to give it the nod in that number mm. ten slot. So, so the suffering. It's nice to see you complete a prison game uh, for once. Whoa, 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 prison game didn't that complete? No way out. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh. Yeah, no. Well. Hey. He might one day. <laughs> uh, I don't, don't want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Kellen, what's your number nine? Uh, number nine, we'll go uh, Crimson Skies. Um, 
one of the f- few dogfighting games. Uh, there's not much of that anymore, which is kind of sad. Uh, but it was very unique in that it was set in like the 1930s. So not World War Two, but not World War II, like in the weird middle era. And it's freaking steampunk. Like it's just the most odd mixture of shit ever. <laughs> <laughs> but it works so well. It it plays really well. It's super smooth and it's just a lot of fun to play. Um, at great online, but also had a really good single player. Mm-hmm. Like just a lot of fun to play. Like I bought it strictly for the online and just like stumbled into the single player. Like, oh, this is actually quite good. It was just a lot of fun to play. All the different planes played differently. Like you had, uh, it was kind of felt like classes, but aircraft. Like just a really well made game. Yeah, I Crimson Skies is one that I haven't played that much. Uh, I'm not a big like dogfight airplane mm-hmm. uh, control type character, but even just the little bit of it that I've played, I can easily recognize why people like it. It is very fun. Like there's something about nailing the controls of something mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. And, and when you do it, you, you know, you got it. And I, well, I think too, that, that yeah, it's just really a lot well. of it has to do with like the chase too, because if oh. it's like a car race, like, you know, I need to take this turn faster or I need to speed up or I need to conserve my boosts or hit the jump, you know, whatever. Like there's only like a handful of thoughts that can go into it. And all of them are just drive better mm-hmm. than the other guy uh, or Pretty you much. know maybe avoid the wreck that uh, he's about to hit or something. This one, like, there's people doing, like, corkscrews and tailspins and, like, going, like, your field of, like, options is, like, 360. So, um, you know, when you're chasing someone shooting, like, the machine gun and he's twirling all over the place and he turns around and shoots a missile, then you have to dodge it. Like, that's a lot more dynamic, uh, dynamic, sure, and, uh, like, you, you have to have a lot better reaction time. So when you finally chase that guy down weaving through like buildings and stuff someone else is shooting at you and you finally blow him up like it feels real good it's very Um, satisfying so yeah i think that's part of it too that it yeah well if i don't turn my list off uh oh nice number nine project gotham racing two um you talked about like user created game types i guess for online (laughs) multiplayer And this was the one, Kellen giggles because he knows I'm going to talk about Cat and Mouse. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, But this is the one I've got very fond memories of online where uh, basically you would choose like, this this is a game sort of like Forza, sort of like Gran Turismo where you have classes of cars, supercars or a class, uh, and then on down all the way to like common cars. Um, Everyone would choose really common cars and one person or like maybe a team of people depending on how many were playing There'd be a cat team and a mouse team, and <laughs> the cat would have like a supercharged like Ferrari or a Lamborghini or something. Like Everyone else is driving around or something like that's TVR Cerbera yeah. V12. Yeah. Everyone else would be like in Mini Coopers or yeah, like Nissan kind of or something like, a like normal that. Mini um, you'd start them. And it was just like a like 10 mile track or something like that and you go to the Nurburgring it's <laughs> 11 and a half miles I think uh, something like that and you know just fun stuff like that on top of just like oh yeah I'm actually racing in this game type as well because you know you're just trying to still be the first to cross the finish line but just stuff like that on top of that game nailed um, like in city racing so like just taking like Times Square or something like that or LA or whatever downtown Chicago and just like making a track through there and you can see people on the side you know the people like cheering or taking pictures like it felt really like real at that time and it was just really cool just to be driving through these areas these popular areas like San Francisco you know whatever else that are like real life cities and just get like the glitz and the glare of that, but also like really good racing. Uh, Cause first and foremost, I guess that makes, um, makes or breaks any racing game is like how good it feels. Like we were talking about a game earlier today that it's just like, Hey, it's got some cool characters in it, but like, how does it play? You know, sort of thing. So yeah. it always comes back to that. And it like, uh, what was it? Bizarre studios. I think that was the name of the people who made um, project Gotham games and been on. Uh, but like, I think, all of their games have felt really good, and this one felt awesome, but it was that spark of user-created stuff online on top of, you know, just kind of when it came out. This was one of the first, obviously number two, uh, Project Gotham games, but those continued on for a while. Got a little bit better in some areas, got a little bit worse in others, but I think this was kind of the 
best cumulative Project Gotham game for sure. Um, that was at least on Xbox that I that we can pick from. But um, fair, I yeah, I uh, I really like this game uh, because control wise, fun wise. The only thing it just doesn't have, I guess, is like music uh, that I can think of off the top of my head because that's the other, I guess, piece of the pie. So maybe that's why it's number nine compared to like a number two. Um, but yeah, really fun game and enjoyed every second of it and online made it only better. My number nine, uh, one of the best action platforming style games, uh, Prince of Persia, Sands of Time. Really like this game. I believe I had it on some of our other lists that we've done. I, I just think it is a really well done game with really smart mechanics that are integrated into the game in a way that you still to this day don't see very often. Uh, time mechanics are always something that's kind of difficult to, to pull off, and I think they did it really well. The ability to kind of um, acrobatically platform different sections, and then you just miss the jump, but you know it's because you jumped a little bit too mm-hmm. low, and then you can rewind time and kind of correct on the fly what you did wrong. Just really neat, had a uh, very satisfying combat, kind of a precursor to this Assassin's Creed world that we live in nowadays, this Batman Arkham world that we live in. Very flashy, uh, looks like it would be complicated to pull off, but you're only really hitting a couple of buttons. Um, just thoroughly enjoyed it. I, th- I think it's the best in, in that series of the Prince of Persia. And um, I, I think it deserves to be on m- most, you know, many of these lists that I've been I've been listening on. I think it's kind of the best in, in its genre, which was not the most popular genre at the time. But like I said, just ties mechanics and gameplay together really, really well, which is always a plus in my book. I, I think that's something that's very difficult to do. Makes you wonder why it hasn't made and, a resurgence. And story. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, they did yeah. the Assassin's Creed Origins, and, like, that was kind of their best time to yeah to do that. Um, well, especially, too, because the rewind feature, because it was nice, it wasn't super cheap, and it wasn't, like, harshly limited to where it was just, like, you get, like, a couple seconds back, and that's it. Um, it, like, it was a nice yeah, middle ground. Yeah, you can rewind, like, combat it, and stuff. Too. It was really it well It really balanced, fits yeah. in with this era that we're in where you don't want games to be too difficult. And if it is, you don't want it to punish like the living hell out of you either. Yeah. So um, it just, from all kind of viewpoints, it seems like it would fit in really well. And people just love Prince of Persia. So I agree. Fair enough. Yeah, so that is my number nine. Kellen, uh-huh. what do you got in that eight slot? Uh, number eight, uh, Full Spectrum Warrior. Um, very one of the most like realistic RTS games ever and that was the point of it mm. it was made to be it was set in modern times for that time so like 04 03 whenever it was so it, it basically plays out like a desert storm style mission um but the whole point of the game was to be as realistic as it could be yeah you're not directly controlling anybody you have to set them up cover you have to set them up to shoot you have, you have like two squads of four sometimes three squads of four and they're not very accurate, so you have to do a lot of the work. Um, but it was so like set up well and so realistic that they even used it to help people from that had actually fought in war with PTSD. Like it was made to be incredibly realistic and used for training, even. Um, but it was also a really well made game and really well done, and it just played out really well. Um, it had a lot like some destructible environment stuff to it, like mostly the cars, I believe. Uh, it was just laid out well. It just um, it, it did what it needed to do, and it did it really well. Yeah, it wasn't in a category that really had a lot of competition, but it was cool because you were basically, I guess for all intents and purposes, like the lieutenant or the commanding officer, and you kind of felt in that position because you know you would be like, okay, well, I need to send my guys this way because obviously there's people over here or some some group would flank and pop up over here, and then you have to react to it in real time and make adjustments. And like he said, it wasn't like you were dealing with like Hawkeye or something who nails every shot. Um, Like, you know, there are people be uh, like suppressing your team down and, you know, you have to go and move it. Like it was like a tactic sort of thing, but it was on the fly and it wasn't any of this like Starcraft stuff where you're building a base and then uh, taking over someone else's. It's just, you have your little group of dudes uh, whether they're split off or whatever, and you want to keep them alive and complete the mission sort of thing. So really fun. 
I have not played this game, and I have nothing to add. Super <laughs> tough, though. It is uh, very tough. It's not very approachable unless like you know what you're getting in, uh, going into it with this like military style mind. But uh, really fun, really rewarding too. Which is my kind of thing. Yeah. Number eight. That'll Crimson Skies. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> High Road to Revenge. Um, I didn't say much when you were talking about it because obviously I knew it was coming up. But yeah, this is very much in a league of its own. I mean, you really only have Ace Combat, which I guess this doesn't exist anymore, uh, <laughs> to compete with it. And even that's not really the same type of thing. But yeah, everything we talked about, uh, just it just felt really good. Playing games, whether it's fly the plane, land the plane, or whether it's do a plane mission in a game, like a Grand Theft Auto type thing, or whatever. Um, sort of like racing games, it all comes down to controls, and this game controlled wonderfully. Um, like, when you would do these weird, like, barrel roll into, like, a corkscrew sort of thing and still hit the target and get away, you know, before you blew up, like, you would feel awesome when you did some of the stuff. Um and they made it in a way that was really fun, and they made it more like an arena shooter, but you were in planes. And it took a, it was, had a little bit of a learning curve, like any sort of racing or plane-type game, but it was quick. Um, the story mode was actually really fun. Like, you basically, like, separate little missions that you would go on, but you learn the game as you were playing it, rather than just go to, like, tutorial, what's step one? Fly, you know, or something like that. Go so, for it. Um, it taught you the game as you played it. It was really fun. Uh, just all the planes really felt. We're good, probably going to talk about a few games where they're sort of like he mentioned with the planes. Like everyone feels unique. You have the big bomber jets that I liked, uh, which are well, like, they like heavy planes that are slower? But yeah, you, but you can't really dodge flying much. Fortress, <laughs> flying fortresses. Yeah. You can't really dodge much, but you can take a beating, and it just takes a few shots to wreck. Uh, you know, this little guy buzzing around. So, um, when there's some little yellow plane that was always annoying. I think so. Uh, but there was just all sorts of strategies and stuff like that, and it would be fun to just go into a room with like. He's this one type, I'm this one type, you know, we got a team and we're versus these guys sort of thing. So it was really fun and interesting take on planes because usually it's just like, can you fly it and can you lock on and can you shoot the missile? But this one, like each plane had its own kind of style and personality to it. And uh, yeah, you just got to choose your own. It was really cool. And all the weapons were really awesome. Just everything about the game, like... A lot of people wouldn't give it tens in every category, like maybe music or visuals or whatever at the time, but I don't really see people marking off really anything. It almost doesn't have too many flaws in it. It's just, you know, it's just at least at bare minimum, probably like a solid eight across the board. It's just really fun. And because you don't get many of these types of games, um, you know, it stands out quite brightly, uh, especially Xbox having its own first party game. So yeah, my number eight, Soul Calibur 2. You get to play as Spawn. <laughs> That's, That's it? it. <laughs> We're done here. Now, uh, Soul Calibur 2, mechanically a great fighting game, still holds up to this day very, very well. Um, yeah, their guest character was Spawn, which, looking back on it now, eh, <laughs> Link, Link's pretty busted. Um, yep. every, every company got their own thing, but one of the earliest forms of a crossover especially for that kind of nature that i mm. i can think of spawn i played a spawn when i played the game because i actually did play it on xbox um that was my choice of, of console to to play the game on uh just mechanically a really great fighting game uh the emphasis on weapon combat is something that is um not common still to this day uh it has very good like flow between the characters and their animations and their attacks which is something that i think a lot of 3d games kind of struggled with early on and they, they've figured it out now or at least some of them have uh figured it out now but i think this game does the 3d combat the arena combat really well like i said emphasis on weapons and um, distance from the opponent and these long range attacks and these short, not long range like projectile, but long range like jabs yeah, and these short range. Seems kind like of a pokes. lot of games took about five 
iterations of it to figure out maybe six or seven uh and this one got it in its second well third and then it screwed it up again (laughs) (laughs) and then they Um, forgot what they did yeah but just still to this day such a such a good uh fighting game and really works on the on the xbox in particular so soul caliber i think i only ever played it in arcades but it was a great arcade fighter yeah it's just a good fight. It is. It uh, was just a good fighting game. Yeah, it is fair. high up on the list on all time fighters. I would say. Yeah, it was awesome to play in arcades. So. That's it for me. What is your? What are we at? Seven. Seven. What's your seven? Uh, Star Wars Battlefront Two. Okay. Um. So. One of probably my favorite like big open online shooter game like Battlefield Battlefront style game because it just had. Anything and everything Star Wars you could ever want to do in the freaking game. Uh, this is the original one, not the newest one, obviously. Um, uh, this game's for the PlayStation <laughs> 4 and the Xbox One. I don't get it. My, <laughs> my only comment on this game is Mace Windu. That's yeah, all they, I they <laughs> added the ability to use like all the uh, the Jedi and the hero characters yeah. and all that fun stuff. Had a ton of maps. It had all sorts of crap you could do. What was the spanning kind of Star Wars canon generation for this game? It had prequels in original and, movies. And original. Mm-hmm. Because it had a campaign that you followed a group of uh, clones. It was like the right. Vader's that's, Fist, the Final Fist, whatever. That's what I remember, yeah. And you literally got to follow their story from episode one or episode two when the clones show up all the way through. And it's really awesome because it has a really good narrative of them going into the kind of over with Vader and doing all that kind of stuff. And it also had one of my favorite modes that you did offline where it was almost like a giant uh i guess like a chess board mm-hmm. it's like a like a command and conquer kind of setup board but yeah. you you would get there and if you ran, in, ran into an enemy fleet you'd have like the fleet battle and then you would go to the planet have the planet battle play it like a giant board game almost like risk i guess mm-hmm. that, that game just did everything and it did all of it really well yeah, we talk about it with movies all the time, where people like remake a movie, and you're like, wow, this is garbage compared to the original one. Yeah. This is one of the only instances I can think of where I'm like, man, this this game that they did is significantly worse than the one that they did many years ago. Yeah, when they yeah. announced doing the new one, they turned the PC servers back on for the original. Yeah. They're like, we want to play the old one. They're like, all right, fine, flip the switch. <laughs> like, it's just a really well-made game. Yeah. And it was very time-relevant when it came out. Uh, yeah. Around while well, that those movies still had buzz and you're not looking back at 10 years ago. You're like to the point where you're like, Oh, I think the prequels suck now. Whereas back then we were like, woo prequels. Like so. new, new Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mace Windu. That's all. Uh, Purple light. <laughs> Spawn in the game though. <laughs> mm, I'll I take Mace Windu. <laughs> <laughs> Number seven for me, Fable, the lost chapters. Fable is an interesting one. Uh, It's a weird mixture when you're talking about RPGs because usually you just want to say Western versus Japanese. Uh, It had a little bit of Japanese influence, like a tiny bit, but it wasn't so much like the typical Western that we're used to, but I guess it kind of got the ball rolling again in action first, RPG second, where like you have RPG elements kind of tucked in there um, that don't really distract you too much from the action of the game but they also improve it in ways and stuff like that um i like the first one the most even if i got to pick the entire catalog of games i would still pick this one correct um just because it was simple enough to like go into this area do these things move to the next area get cooler stuff get better weapons feel stronger that was one of the things about fable that i like the most is that you felt you literally you felt like you were doing something as yeah. you were going through the game and i know you talk about that a lot with some of the rpgs that you play you don't yeah. like to start off the game as like a god type character but uh, you also don't want to end the game where you're just like i'm just kind of hitting for like 10 more damage and i'm kind of doing the same things that when i started like this one you can tell like aesthetically whether like the armor you're getting uh you age in the game uh to a certain degree um you get scars and stuff like that. You physically yeah, you look, look different depending yeah. on yeah. Your, uh, your choices. If you're There's a big choice. nice person or a <laughs> mean person. You can definitely tell just by looking. Yeah. Uh, you got to choose your own nickname. Chicken uh, chase. <laughs> you got to go kick chickens around. Uh, it's just every. It just had a lot of stuff that I think people like about the Breath of the Wild type game. Um, and it had it in this one, obviously not to the grand scale, obviously not with the Zelda name slapped to it, but, um, 
I think it had a lot of those same elements where you can kind of just casually stroll around, dick around, and oh yeah, I guess play this cool game that's got a really good story. Um, and yeah, like it was one of the few at that time where it was European made that was just really, really well. Because like I said, it's always kind of like West versus Japan and West usually ends up meaning in a for that or like Canada or something like that. But, um, European made, um, obviously I'm pretty sure everyone who's followed games at least for a long time knows Peter Molyneux. So there was that aspect of the game too. Um, and it was one of the type of games too, like even when you beat the game, the credits are rolling. It, it's telling you the number of pizzas the design team uh, consumed while developing the game. Just like fun little stuff like that. And it makes you feel, I guess it's sort of like a warm and cozy type of RPG where it's like you feel like you were a part of the experience, I guess, or they had you in mind. Um, whereas some RPGs you can feel like you're kind of distant, like this save the world from this epic space invading thing. It's just like I can kind of, uh, you know, understand this and get into it, but it's kind of beyond my realm of thinking or a grand like JRPG where you're just like, okay, this is ridiculous. <laughs> like a sword that's like three skyscrapers uh, long or something like that. And you're just fighting weird things. So um, not too much disconnect feels like a nice little, almost like a storybook uh, story, yeah, the way they presented clearly it what they're going for you. Yeah. Um, it felt more like a tale, I guess. Uh, like, like a fable? <laughs> Got it. Uh, <laughs> you timed that really well, week. too. Um, I'll never have it again. But, uh, yeah, just the way they presented it felt really nice at that time. And, honestly, uh, the sort of presentation that I was talking about kind of lends itself to me thinking, because currently I'm playing through Octopath Traveler, and it's kind of the same thing. Like, you're getting, like, told a story in a very, like, book form or a short tale or fable. Uh, but, yeah. Yeah. Ah. But yeah, a lot of things, a lot of memories from that game too, and it was just really nice for its time. Number seven, Mech Assault. Um, this is one of those that is phenomenal online, still really fun offline, great split screen. You can do your uh, your system link and kind of get that feeling still nowadays. Uh, this is kind of the the hero shooter before hero shooters, the you know, in a universe that's not commonly i mean sort of mechs are kind of common but not done like this. not as much lately yeah, yeah it, and definitely not like this um you have your classes that are a lot quicker but don't do that much damage you have your classes that are kind of in the middle you have your heavies that can't move very quickly but they do tons of damage and that moving not not being able to move very quickly actually ends up mattering because the game is sort of a game of power-ups and risk and reward you knock out one enemy and they die to this huge explosion that if you're near it <laughs> you can hit you too and start this yeah. chain reaction. The buildings are destructible. By the end of a level, you Excellent can, explosion you can level the entire map. It looks like the end of a Godzilla film yeah, or something you, you like can that. Pretty much level the entire, the <laughs> like entire map. Like one building left. You're like, oh. Um, I believe there's three different weapons for each uh, robot that each mech that you're playing as. It's like you, a loadout. Yeah, you find the these uh, power ups for them to make them stronger and stronger, and they eventually, after you keep using them, like downgrade again. But if you kill a robot, you get to pick up more health and more power ups, uh, so you kind of become stronger. But like I said, there's this system where like you'll knock out an enemy and kill them, but like you can't just run in and try to pick up the loot because you the explosion <laughs> will kill you, yeah. which happened a lot. But you can, if you're one of these faster uh, classes, run in and steal the loot from somebody else's kill, and then now you're stronger, and you can kind of run circles around the bigger mechs. The bigger yeah. mechs have trouble running away from these <laughs> explosions. So there's, a, there's this whole just, it's really good gameplay, uh, and that's what it comes down to. It, it does have a story mode. I think it is worth playing. Uh, you actually unlock some yeah, pretty cool mechs are worth it. From, from doing the story mode. Um, but yeah, it is just an arena mech game, like hero shooter, and it is just phenomenal. And it's always fun, like games of that time didn't have a lot of flying. Flying is something mm -hmm. that um, people didn't execute very well when they yeah. tried it, but you, you can get these mechs with jump jets and stuff like that. Everyone felt different, and you always had like one or two favorites that you would kind of pick and, and go back to. And I believe they had different, like, um, they had different, like, uh, Models, there is like kind of a male and female version of yeah, of like there's the Mad Cat and the Timberwolf that had mm. different loadouts, but it was the same chassis. Yeah, slightly different. The Raven, the name, yeah, yeah. This game is just pure arena gameplay 
fun, which that is kind of a big sticking point to me for this console in general. Is these are games where the like deathmatch mm-hmm. games, basically. That's uh, what I was talking about. Crimson Skies. I didn't want to name drop some of the other ones that are similar, but what Crimson Skies is like when an, a certain plane is shooting at you or you're chasing one, you know exactly what you, it you is. Same it thing with Mech Assault. If like a missile comes whizzing past you, like I know what this is. Oh, there's and a then lava you know, being shot at me. <laughs> if there's <Uh-oh>. three <laughs> lava bursts. <laughs> oh, there's a Ragnarok. And, then, me and then you instantly know, oh, it's this type. I have to respond like this. Like there's so much of that with Crimson Skies, with Mech Assault, a couple other games too that, yeah, they all kind of blend in with each other. But yeah, flying, you have mechs, you have other stuff going on. And yeah, the system did it, did it really well. Also, it had my favorite game mode, uh, which is Capture the Flag. I love oh, it. had a great Capture the Flag. Love Capture the Flag. Just classic. Get the flag. Bring it mm-hmm. to your base. Well, one of my Can't go wrong with Capture the Flag. One of my favorite Capture levels. the Flags ever. Because we yes. had a group of a few people. We even had like positions for them. And it was just oh, yeah. Playing casually. It was so good. I had a lo- almost half my top list has Capture the Flag <laughs> moments in it. That's completely <laughs> they, fair. They're, they're my favorites. All right, Kellen, what do you got for number six? Uh, number six. Uh, one that Nick's brought up already, uh, Project Gotham Racing 2. Uh, one of my favorite racing games ever because uh, it was the perfect balance of realistic and arcade racer, which is usually what I like. Um, I don't like too much arcade sometimes, and I don't really like the realistic racers because if I want to drive a car, I'll just go <laughs> drive a car. <laughs> uh, but it balanced that incredibly well and had the most incredible game mode ever named Cat and Mouse. Where I would put Nick in the green Mini Cooper and I'd <laughs> get in the green TVR and we would just try to yeah. get the Mini Cooper there. Uh, but one of the best like communities ever because that was a game that we didn't come up with. Somebody else came mm-hmm. up with it and it got brought to us. Uh, but the polish of that game was incredible. And it, it like the Crimson Skies, it just had the perfect controls for those cars and the way that game was set up. And a really good, well set up single player. But it, that game was mostly the community and online racing. Mm-hmm. I mean, just one of my favorite racing games ever. Super approachable, which is important for racers. Anybody could pick it up and be competent, but not anybody could pick it up and just beat everybody. Mm. The Mario Kart track. BGR2. There were also... Without power-ups. I know... With real cars. We're talking about... uh, I I meant about the pickup and... Like, you can have fun You literally can pick it up and... You can pick up and race and have fun with it. They were talking a lot about online communities, which aren't so much there anymore, but another good feature of that is, like, everyone... Most people that we ran into were like super respectful. Like they didn't try and just wipe you out every race. Like some people would even send me like apologies, like, "Hey man, I wrecked the shit out of you on that last lap. I'm sorry." <laughs> just like I dominated your like, It was like okay. it, was, it felt really professional. Like a lot of people were there to set the best times or to actually like compete, and it wasn't just like oh, I'm just gonna drive backwards and wreck everyone, <laughs> you know, sort of thing. So. Uh, that was Video cool games were aspect. a different time. That was only in there. Cat and Mouse. Because yeah. only the people that really cared went online. <laughs> Trolls weren't that <laughs> yeah, big of a Yeah, thing. there weren't a whole lot of people online. And everybody had a headset because it came with the thing. Yeah. yeah. My and favorite like, was Everyone was willing to try like, the was Cat the, and Mouse. Um, and, like, voice changer that you could do. Because <laughs> like, 90% of the community was like 12 or younger. Yeah. And they so sounded they, like robots. And, yeah, and yeah. they all had on the dark voice the well. <laughs> so and we're like, that's not your real voice. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> like, you sound like a special Batman. Yeah, I was like, why, why is Batman always playing? That's what it was me? called. I think it was called Dark Man. I think that it was the, the name of the voice changer. <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> I like the robot. And one. you could do like Helium was another one. They'd be yeah. like, hey. Chipmunk or something. Yeah, yeah. Like, please Ro- get out of this robot party. was the most annoying the with a high pitched kid voice on, on the back of it because it was just like, oh, my headset. Like, this is ear piercingly <laughs> awful. Um, Number six, is that where we're at? Yeah, that sounds right. Ninja Gaiden Black. Ooh. This okay. was, at least for me, uh, since everyone likes to use the catchphrase, the Souls game, this was the Souls game before Souls games uh, for me. Soul. Um, incredibly difficult. And with Black, they introduced a new difficulty on top of a ton of stuff. Like, this was kind of the era when they. If they re-released a game with certain expansions, like if you didn't just buy all the DLC and you got the extended version, you got a lot. You It was well worth the full price of the game again, or maybe the $40 price tag if they discounted it, you know, whatever. Um, this came with a ton of stuff, and it didn't even need to. If they just, like, enhanced the graphics and just put a few things back in there, maybe tweak some things, sure. But they packed a bunch of stuff back into the game. 
the one that I remember the most is the difficulty mode, and there were also just like scripted missions, uh, which the game didn't really have um, initially. But controls were awesome, and it was one of those. You sort of talked about it with Prince of Persia. If you're just watching the screen and you're like, oh my god, like that guy just had to do like a 30 input move to do that really stylish kill. Uh, but it was like really simplified, even though it was complex. It was tight controls, I guess, but it was simple enough to where you could pick it up and it wasn't like, oh, I haven't played this in a week. I'm going to be trash. Um, like you could pick it up and get back right where you're at and complete the game. It's really cool. There's not those t- styles of games too much anymore. But with this new wave of like feudal Japan, yeah, I think we're getting we're back very into close to yeah. being back. In yeah, that. we're getting back. I mean, when games get shown at E3, and I'm like, is that a Tenchu game? Like, we're close enough to yeah. the Ninja <laughs> Gaiden, uh, you know, style. So I think we're almost back there, but it feels good to go back and look at this game because, as far as like just pure like action type games. This was, at least back then, I think this was comparable to like a God of War to like a really sure. major Sony um, type game. So no, yeah, definitely a game that kind of fell uh, for whatever reason, you yeah. know, just a, as a as a series. But no, it, it kind of in its, its prime, actually definitely in, in its prime um, around there. Really cool. I do miss those style games and I do mm. think that we are getting back to I think to the that, last so. time I saw him was in a Dead or Alive game. <laughs> That's <laughs> true. <laughs> Absolutely true. And he's still alive, baby. Still, still alive. <laughs> I like it. Uh, my next one is one that was also already mentioned and it is Star Wars Jedi Knight Academy. Yeah. Um, absolutely love this game. Again, a very sweet capture of the flag mode. Go get the flag, bring it back. Oh, they have your flag. Knock them out, pick up the flag, et cetera, et cetera. You don't normally get to carry a lightsaber when you're playing capture the flag. The flag. So. Oh, yeah. yeah, and you get the force powers, so you can do... You oh, I speed. Want, I want the speed oh, the force speed. and the <laughs> high jump. The level three force speed and the jump, yeah. And the jump, oh, it, it was so, so, so fun. And then you, you'd always have people kind of uh, guarding the other flag, and you get to the flag sometimes, and you just see somebody standing there with the dual saber, the and you're dual- like, oh, we're we going to fight. <laughs> uh, like, really, really a like giant it. roadie in here with the dual saber. <laughs> the uh, <laughs> different choices of lightsabers. There is the staff. There is the two sabers. Staff and, dual or the single the single saber, which had a heavy, medium, and light attack scheme that you could switch it, it, on the fly. Which it was, was really they cool. were certainly not just for aesthetic. They very much had different gameplay. It almost felt yes, like elements. a fighting game the way you could. Yeah, use it that very stuff. much like, like a fighting game actually. Um, there is special moves that you could kind of input, like a butterfly uh, kind of kick with the staff. You could do some cool force power stuff with uh, the other ones. Do the back sweep. Throw, you could throw <laughs> yeah, the back stab was always good. You could throw the, your saber and call the rolling it back. Stab. Once it, you felt real awesome when you caught somebody off guard with the throw the saber at their head mm. from behind and call your saber back, and you just hear the oh <laughs> of their of their death scream. Um, yeah, it integrated, I personally played with weapons off, but it integrated weapons into the game, uh, in a very interesting way. Uh, it, it could be as chaotic as you wanted it to. I think you could have 16 players, maybe all running sure. around being, yeah. being, yeah. being crazy, or you could have, um, one-on-one duels, which were just as fun, a uh, very scalable game. Like you said, it, it does have a single player that's worth playing, uh, where you're kind of this Jedi student, I believe it was, yeah. um, and Luke opens up his own uh, his you're, training you're academy. You're a Jedi yeah. Knight in a Jedi academy. Uh, just a phenomenal Star Wars game. Really makes you feel like Batman. Like Batman. <laughs> really makes you feel like, like a Jedi, um, which is something that I think is even lost on these new Star Wars Battlefront games. Like when you get to yeah. play as some Jedi for a few minutes, you're like, eh. Like I get eh. shot. Yeah. Like you feel way more like a Jedi like this in the decision making in the picking from the strangest cast of characters that they could have possibly oh, it's thought wonderful. up. Oh, uh, Really, really excellent stuff. So, Jedi Knight Academy. Cool. Uh, where am I at? Number five? Mm-hmm. Uh, number five, Mech Assault. Um, I played way too much of this game to the point where me and Kevin <laughs> picked it up a year or two ago, and yes. I remembered every single thing. <laughs> oh, my God. I think that Let's Play is live on, on our channel. It's one, I of hope our, so. one of our older, older videos, but, man, I was not prepared for what you were ready to dish <laughs> out was, in that game. <laughs> I, I was also very good at this game. Yeah, we weren't even versing each other. We were doing the horde mode, which is rare. but I think you had, like, 27 kills, and I was like, ooh, I got three. <laughs> yeah, I played a lot of that game. Yeah, the... The the explosion power was like a little mini game in the combat. It was wonderful. 
It was extremely well balanced. Because you had the, the lighter Some, mechs always had a chance, the heavier mechs. You always could tell had a when chance. somebody was about to die because they had this like sparking. They would start. They would start to them, smoke. And sometimes you would just run straight into enemy fire just so that you would die and blow blow. Oh, up you would you would suicide. Kamikaze, uh, it was pretty so much. Great. <laughs> yeah, everybody. If they died, and if they had power ups, they would drop them based on what what level they were. There were four color power ups: red, yellow, blue, green. Because uh, you had the three different weapons in green for health. Yeah. All the buildings were destructible. Like it, it would go from like a fully populated city to just a flat wasteland. <laughs> By the end of the round, you're just like, "What did we do here?" Oh, it was so good. I played a a whole lot of that game. Yeah. Like there were multiple times where I would be on multiple top 100 leaderboards because I played way too much of this game. Well, he was at the top of Mega Soul. I was wonderful. at the top of Counter Strike on Xbox. It so was we wonderful. just kind of chose our own path and I went from there. I did play a lot of play a lot of Xbox Counter Strike. Yeah. But, but Mega Soul was where I lived and met a lot of Xbox Live people. Yeah. And the reason I play inverted joystick still to yeah, this day it drives me crazy. because it was standard on Mech Assault and it was standard it was on Crimson Skies. Standard Skies. on a lot yeah. of older games. It was standard on that and Crimson Skies, so that kind of stuck Basically with me. Basically anything you would control with a joystick. Yeah. A plane, a mech, whatever. It was standard on a lot of things that were not controlled with joysticks. Tons, tons of games from back then. I am surprised because I play a lot of old games still. And uh, I'm always surprised how many are inverted and like locked that way. A lot yeah. of shooters mm-hmm. and stuff like that. I think the James Bond games and stuff. Yeah, that all, was that was where I picked up that. Was mostly inverted. mostly Mega Salt. But yeah, I I the game I want brought back most in this world is Mega Salt. Like I'd love to have a new Mega Salt. Me too. Well, we're, we're actually getting one, but it, it's not like the console. It's not like this. It's it, it's, it's Mech Warrior, Mech Warrior series. which is their PC version. Yeah, it's less arcadey, a little more realistic. Yeah. Because I've played MechWar online a little bit. Yeah. And it's I, really well made, but it requires like a community kind of commitment thing. Yeah. Yeah, Mech Assault. I played way too much of this game. I like it. He did. It's He's wonderful. on my friends list. I always saw Mech Assault next to his name. It was wonderful. <laughs> uh, my next one, number five, is a game that's on this table, Jade Empire. Uh, it is Bioware at its most finest. Uh, this game, uh, like actually... A lot of the games we're talking about, kind of in its own category as far as types of games. Sure, it's an RPG. Sure, it's an action RPG. Uh, it's a bit of a kung fu fighter, um, but you know, also it has a lot of stuff that a Kotor or Mass Effect or whatever like kind of staple Bioware and the um, yikes uh, type of game <laughs> dun, dun, have, dun, dun, dun. Um, where you have choice. You can take the good path or the bad path. Uh, dark versus light, you know, whatever you want to call it, good versus evil. Um, so you had that typical sort of approach to the game, but the action was like most of these types of games, especially like the fable that I mentioned, maybe a couple other games that get mentioned here. Um, the combat is very deliberate. Uh, it's not super fast paced. There's light attacks, fast attacks, you know, stuff like that. But Jade Empire's combat is extremely fast. It is like it almost feels like you turn the speed up on the game or something like some of these remasters get where you can crank the speed up. It feels sort of like that, like who turned the dial all the way up? Because a lot of these kung fu action sequences that you do, it's almost just like real speed fighting versus like video game speed fighting where you're just like, oh. Huh, you know, something like that where you're uh, swinging the big sword around or something like that in typical types of games. This one is very much like you're throwing like 100 punches in like a span of like a second. Just the real crazy kung fu type uh, martial arts. And it was really fun that way because it was different. Uh, the music is, I would say, stellar in it. Um, you don't really get these types of soundtracks anymore. So... It was nice to have that Eastern sort of influence that really this system doesn't have too much of. A lot of it's Western, Western, Western. Um, so it was nice to get a little bit of that without having it become like a like a turn style oriented like combat game, like a JRPG or something like that. It very much had its roots in Western um, gameplay, but it made it into its own Eastern thing, and it didn't feel uh gimmicky i guess that was just like oh we think we know asian people you know something like that like it felt (laughs) i know one this is fine (laughs) (laughs) he said it's good it it felt pretty true you know kind of to the like the culture and stuff going on and the areas felt really 
real, I guess, and lived in, and the NPCs were awesome, and the characters were awesome, music was awesome, the pacing of the game was really good, too. A lot of these games, uh, at least in this era, we didn't really hit the 100-hour you know, type of games, the 50 hours, any of that stuff. That was more Sony. Um, that was more like PC games, I guess, where you really hit those kind of time frames. This one's a pretty long game. Um, I feel like by the time you went back to areas and talked to the person you didn't talk to before, beat the thing that you couldn't beat before, or felt strong enough to try the thing that you didn't try before, um, lots of character interactions and side stories to go through, and it just turned out to be one really well-made game. And like I said, it just doesn't really have anything else in that category, so it sort of shines. Um, I don't know where in the Bioware list of games, at least pre-Andromeda, um, where a lot of people would put it, but I know a lot of the people that have played it, it's sort of like the, the Easter egg of Bioware games. Most people don't haven't touched it if they've played the Mass Effects and stuff like that. Uh, they just haven't gotten to it or whatever. Um, but most people who've played it, I think, have really enjoyed it. Um, and I know Todd, who's not here, uh, would be jumping for joy if I talked about Jade Empire. That's yeah. one of his favorites, too. Um, but yeah, really fun. Mine, my next one, is um, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. Um, so this game has a production value that is far higher than a lot of other games of this time um it gives you you know a story driven game for your xbox which was something that was way more common at, at this uh point but like i said this is either the story driven thing or the party like i don't feel like there's a huge mix uh, and this is definitely the story almost every character in the game is voiced over like it, it actually aged incredibly well uh they have kind of two modes of combat with your your pseudo turn it's not turn based but it's like it is turn based it's just very pause, fast paced turn based yeah it's like pause decision like you can you have the do option decision to pause. making yeah but it's not actual turn based mm-hmm. um it, it actually fights a lot like how runescape fights to be honest um but anyway they an incredibly vast world tons of characters tons of little side stuff to do tons of people to talk to and like i said the, just the production value and the scale of the world for something of this time period is um kind of amazing to go back to and, and check out uh everything that they were able to accomplish then um and let alone look at it now and be like wow when you're comparing it to some of the other stuff that, that came out around that time um and then obviously it is a beloved star wars um story that everybody still wants them to go back to nowadays please? that's one of the yeah. biggest things people please. are like please do the old republic stuff <laughs> like that that's what we yeah. want to say um and another just kind of interesting thing about it is it's not like they didn't feel like they were pandering to star wars fans which is oh, sure. interesting they aren't like oh here's a star wars game here's the lightsaber go get go kill the stuff with the force use use the force luke well, like they, it wasn't like that at all it's use the push thing. they also didn't have to be like Luke Skywalker, Vader. Yeah, uh, that's like, true. It's just this is multiple hundreds of years before all that stuff even happens. Yeah, don't worry about it. Uh, but it ta- like it ta- it's a journey to yeah. even get to the not the Star Wars because it feels like Star Wars the whole way, but the Star Wars that you know and you saw in the films. Like it, it takes a long time to get the, you know that lightsaber. Um, so oh yeah, it's a, it's a milestone to get the lightsaber. Oh yeah, and you even <laughs> get a really a ship that can go places <laughs> that you've heard of at least. More from that game later. Kellen. Really? Number four. Number four. Um, so this is a little game called Burnout 3, another racing game. Um, maybe my favorite racing game ever. Um, because you got to do things other than just race, like crash the shit out of stuff. <laughs> um, it had great mechanics, one. And then just the random crashing stuff was just hilarious and I, fun. And I like the point of the crash mode was to literally well, ra- cause, cause the most damage and create the biggest insurance bill. It literally, <laughs> <you> literally t- <laughs> it clocked it in dollar amounts. <laughs> the point was to do enough damage to your car where you could blow it up with the push of a button. Yeah. And then in the midst, and they literally had set up like intersections and jumps and just stupid shit to do. And mixed in all this was a great racing game. Um, had semi real cars like names and stuff but a whole bunch of different cars to choose from and different stuff to do and a lot of explosions 
Yeah, I, I <laughs> loved the uh, the crash mode for oh, it was a game. Blast. Such a smart idea. It, of it something to do. Out. And it actually had like the destruction, which a lot like uh, Gran Turismo and stuff were. You know, oh, can't hurt the car. You yeah. can't, that's not how you this can works. scratch. The it's paint. like in this one, it's like ah, uh, destroy it. <laughs> here's, the, here's the thing: we want to kill everything. Well, and then it had like a list of like a hundred or maybe it even had like, more. Or it was like one twelve cars. Um, or some weird well, yeah, number. like number of cars, but also like um, not really chapters, but like marks that it went. You like this one, this map, or this part of the race or the crash mode was just like get a hundred thousand and this one's just like do this thing do this thing and and hit the bus you need or, to hit you, know, you need to hit like that. you need to blow so up three buses it had like actual goals for you to hit too it, it was almost like, like a puzzle a, yeah the way you had to do it because you could like steer the crash and try to mm-hmm. do more stuff but uh to this day like i know we haven't done genres or anything like that so i won't say best or worst or number two or you know something like that definitely at least for me the most satisfying racing game there's almost nothing better than you know, getting in like a really heated race, it feels like you guys are going like 300 miles an hour. You slam into him and you're waiting for it. Wait a second, wait a second. And then it sees like, uh, take down, take down. And you see like his name or his gamer tag if you were playing online or something. Push like that. him into the guardrail. It just feels like, oh man, you got it. And then you see your meter, uh, fill up with nitro. Uh, when you took him down, it's just like there is n- almost nothing more satisfying. It's like I'm in the home stretch, I've got it now. I was up there with like headshots or like a really cool move on like Unreal or something like that, where you're just like you felt awesome. Triple uh, kill. Yeah, something like Monster. that. Monster. <laughs> it was almost like car combat. Like it yeah. was it was wonderfully done. And I loved that game. Nick, your number four. Might be the only one on this uh panel, I guess, who mentions this game, but I don't know, but my number four (laughs) is the Chronicles of Riddick Escape from Butcher Bay. So I guess this is my prison game entry uh, like you had uh, for your number 10. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) Once again, not a common setting, just not for survivor horror, but just like anything uh, is in a prison. A very dark Uh, prison. This is using a character from a film series, which was only one film at that point, uh, into it. Um, was it one? I thought it was two. At the time of this game, it was just one. Uh, I don't think the second one had hit I don't yet. think Chronicles had come um, I know they were close. It, it used a movie character in not that movie. It was not Pitch Black, the game or the movie that they got Riddick from, um, but it was a prequel. Um, yeah, it was a prequel telling like you know how did he become who he is like how a did canon he... story yeah. to it yep. it was a um licensed game that didn't suck yeah uh what, yeah which is very rare we, we and can't i think do like, a top 10 of that yeah like <laughs> uh like yeah, maybe. kotor and stuff like that yeah. like there's very few licensed games yeah. that were phenomenal and it was really cool because in the movie you you know you maybe catch two of these little tidbits of information and then they took that and just made a game out of it uh like where he came from how did he get his you know whatever um like how did the, how did he become who he is and you get to play a prison game so not only are you dealing in currency where it's like cigarette packs and you know you have to worry about oh is this guy gonna stab me in the back with a shiv um and you know you're going from cell to cell area to area so in some regards, not really like survival, but like, you know, it was an action thing, but you could easily die if you just weren't paying attention, weren't checking your surroundings. Like you had to survive uh, the prison aspect of it. And literally it's just an escape game. Um, how do you get out of there? A bunch of cool characters that showed up. Um, you get the voice and the style of Riddick, uh, what made him cool in the movie but that you don't really get much out of because the movie was like half him and half like alien type of movie. This one is just all him. So you get to hear his uh, voice acting, the stuff that happens to him, how he responds. So you get like the cool story behind it. And the biggest thing at it's, it's time. I'm sure I can find the old magazines that I had too, like the uh, EG, EGM. Uh, like, yeah, EGMs and whatever else talking about it. It was probably the best looking Xbox game at the time. Oh uh, yeah. Probably. Um, just it looked wonderful and it was one of those just like man 
video games are real life. It's looking crazy now, guys. Um, it had but, really satisfying combat, too. Yeah. Not a lot of games did first-person uh, like melee mm-hmm. combat, but this yeah. one had it with blocking, putting your hands yeah. up, kind of counterattacking. I think I, I remember this game heavily because uh, you could see your feet when you looked down, yeah. and that was something that <laughs> always bothered me in first-person games. I'm like, why can't yeah. you see your feet? Where are my and feet? I looked down in right I was like, oh. My feet are here. My arms are here. What I is this? I'm I actually real. feel like every, the character. Uh, it makes you feel like Batman. Like Riddick. It, uh, <laughs> it also had weight to it too. So and it's something we talk about with like Killzone games where you feel like you had actual weight to yourself and you're not just like mm. darting across the screen and doing like crazy ninja moves that don't feel believable when you're in first person. Yeah. But this one, like you, you're having prison style fights. Uh, and like I said, if you get that one little shiv, like you have the upper hand versus like some flaming sword or a uh, gun or something like that. Um, or but it had a really cool story and it wasn't just the prison aspect of it. It was the breakout. It was the characters that you ran into. And like I said, having the fact that it was licensed and you got the guy from the movie and you got to be the badass from the movie that whole way through and then at the end of it you're just like oh okay well i understand how he got to the point where he is in the movie now it's just it's really nice to get that and it wasn't just let's make that movie a game or let's make the thing that's already in existence a game let's just make our own thing and it's so good that it can tie into the you know widely received movie too so it's really awesome and like you said um not many licensed games that don't suck or aren't just kind of feel like just sort of a cash grab uh, i probably couldn't do a top 10 list uh, in this style uh, for licensed games like that so yeah um this is one of the few games too uh i had a standee in my room so it was just a big riddick uh, with his dual blades doing like his big cross arm thing bad idea because when you wake up in the middle of the night and you have only like a tiny bit of light maybe from like the moon uh, coming through the windows and you see a uh, large muscle man and goggles and two daggers you get scared <laughs> uh, is this why you won't watch spooky movies <laughs> no <laughs> did riddick do this uh, to you <laughs> but uh that that standee didn't last very long in my room at least not in that spot but that uh, thing was awesome in- interesting side story to that but yeah i love this game so much uh, my number four, a game that I love so much, probably my favorite game on this list, possibly, um, Silent Hill 4, The Room. So this is the first Silent Hill game that actually, like, launched on Xbox. Um, there's other ones that made their way there as, like, kind of definitive editions or whatever. But this one launched there. Uh, this is a really unique Silent Hill game. It is in first person. You're locked in a room, and you're kind of exploring around this area that you're locked in, you can see the outside world and everything seems normal, yet it's clearly not because you cannot leave uh, your room. You're looking through like peepholes and stuff, which is always scary. You kind of feel a little weird, a little like peeping Tom area. You're like looking through cracks in the walls and stuff at other characters and kind of wondering why they're not concerned. Um, then you find a hole in your in your wall that you can... Yeah, it gets weird. You find a hole in your wall that you climb through and you end up in Silent Hill there you meet kind of a you meet a character there you go through their story and it has a really cool uh dynamic where you kind of fail to save these characters throughout their stories and uh you they emphasize combat a little bit more in this one where you're not a badass you're not a military guy but you can stun enemies and you you, they're you're way more um, you're way better at combat than you were in any of the other Silent Hills. So they offset this by adding ghosts that can go through walls, they can chase you anywhere in the level, and you can't kill them. And you're actually hindered just from them being around, let alone them attacking you. And the way that you deal with these ghosts is there's four, I believe, daggers that you can find throughout the game, and you can knock down the ghosts and stab them with the dagger, and it'll pin them to the ground so they don't chase you anymore. But you have to like go back and get the dagger back and kind of bring it to the next ghost scenario and all all that stuff. It was really smartly done. Then once you hit the halfway point through the game, you're doing sort of an escort mission through the back half of the game where you're retreading all these areas. But depending on what you did um, will change 
how the story kind of plays out. So, for instance, if you pin down this one ghost, they won't show up later in the game because they're still pinned down. But if you didn't, suddenly you'll have multiple ghosts all chasing you and they all act differently. Some of them kind of have teleporting abilities. Some, you know. Um, so it's just a very unique Silent Hill game. Very awesome. It's cutting between this first person um, scenario and the third person scenario. The first person scenario gets super spooky um as your apartment is clearly haunted and these hauntings will happen in your apartment and you need to find like ways to purify them and and stop them the apartment's kind of your safe haven so once there's a certain point in the game happens and all of a sudden you are not safe in your apartment you feel super vulnerable like it makes you feel vulnerable even though it's not through combat um which is a really hard thing to do in survival horror um so yeah silent hill 4 the room definitely worth playing if you like spooky scaries uh and has actually a really good story uh that's pretty streamlinely told for a silent hill game because a lot of times their stories are like you got to find the things in the environment and this one's told Mm -hmm. uh at kind of a different level than the the other silent hill games i want nick to play this game pass damn Uh, (laughs) number three uh fable the lost chapters um, one of my favorite RPGs, probably of all time. Um, it did everything at the time that I wanted an RPG to do. Um, you start off as just a normal ass dude. You end up becoming fucking awesome. <laughs> you you get the, he actually has gear that's relevant, unlike Fable Two and Three, where you you don't gear up at all. Which I love gear and loot drops and that kind of stuff in game. Um, I love the the way the magic is set up in this game. It's set up basically like pallets. Like, you would hit Y to change your palette, and A, B, and X would all do different things. So you could, like, set up, like, this is my weak idiot palette. This is, like, my 1v1 palette. Like, it just did things extremely well that I like in RPGs. Um, It told a a very good story in an excellent setting. Albion's fucking awesome. Mm -hmm. Like, it's a great setting. Um, I love all the different, like, little villages and cities you go to. Um, The the melee combat in that game is, is perfect. Like, I wouldn't change anything about it. Of course they do for two and ruin my life. But <laughs> that's a whole other story. Um, but Fable was great. It it ends with you getting something. You're like, well, I wish I could use that. And then Lost Chapter, he's like, oh, cool. They hicks into the end of the game. We should we should do a top ten ga- games that fucked up their sequels. Uh, yeah, that'd be a good one. Yes. Go. <laughs> Son of a bitch. <laughs> that's not a bad idea. Oh, no, I, I love this game, and I had only played one or two RPG kind of style games at the time. I was like, this is fucking sweet. I need more of this in my life. Um, but yeah, I still go back to that game every now and then. Um, it, just, it was the perfect RPG at the time for me. So It, had the, it had the talking doors that give you the riddles. Like I just loved everything mm-hmm. they did in that game. I, did, I didn't expect this to be that high on your list, actually. Oh, I love this uh, game. I'm su- Well, yeah. I, I know there's a lot of good games, but I knew it was going to be top three, uh, most likely for this guy. Nick probably knows my top three, but anyways. Maybe. Yeah, Speaking maybe. of that number three, is that where we're on now? Yeah. Really? Number th- whoa. whoa. Yeah, I guess we're on number three. That's how it works. Halo Combat Evolved. So, Halo 1. Oh. You made Heaven a weird face. Displeased. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Um, well, in a list like this, it's uh, like I said, for me, I'm not approaching this as if I say Halo. In this case, I'm not trying to say Halo greater than two, greater than three, you know, whatever. Uh, I'm trying not to do that. That does factor into it a little bit, but I think as far as, hey, mister, you just got a new Xbox, you need to start here. Um, Halo 1 was incredible uh to put it lightly there's a reason why it be it became like even if you watch like tv shows are like oh what video game you play in there bob it's like i'm playing halo like halo was a very buzzword and it caught on to people who really didn't know too much about video games like everyone knew what halo was whether they were the mom buying the game the kid playing it or the dad acting uh, mildly interested in it i guess uh, like uh it became synonymous i guess with xbox uh like halo is xbox um you know up until gears and stuff like that kind of you know stole some of that territory away i guess um everyone knows who master chief is if you regularly play video games uh like this is basically what got it all started obviously it being number one but um i think it was the perfect kind of launching point for this style of game uh fps's on consoles 
Um, this was a great place for it to start. I feel like the controls were really suited to an Xbox controller. I don't, I can't imagine myself playing this on like a PS2, PS3 style controller or even PS4 or whatever. Um, it just feels very suited to the Xbox itself. Um, you rush through the story mode. You got all this whole like new world uh, that was built from the ground up. Uh, you get this awesome setting. Um, you know, books start pouring out after it. Like all of this stuff, like you could really feel like it was like a full like marketed game. Um, and yeah, like it's one of those two where you get a protagonist who isn't like, he's the cool guy, he's the Marine, you know, he's the whatever, but he doesn't have like, he's not like all of these other protagonists that you can named because they're cool lines or the witty nature or the way they look like he always looks the same you never really get to see him anyway um he says very few lines he just kind of he's there the people that you remember are uh cortana your little ai lady who's always with you uh you remember the aliens you remember the different style of aliens and kind of like the how they interact with each other and all of these different factions kind of going against each other um the music obviously top notch everyone knows like the classic like the monks uh doing that menu theme music um a lot of the songs are catchy something you can still hum um something where you know you hear it in a trailer you're getting hyped for it um controls are awesome guns were I'm awesome in a trailer listening to, <laughs> to halo <laughs> that's i mean too, that's I what i thought too uh, for some reason <laughs> i'm in a video trailer but whatever <laughs> dun, 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 dun. we'll go with that too um i'm rolling away and to talk about, like I said, this is the system link. This is the house party style of game. This is the one that people are playing. Um, obviously, there's a few other ones. Sure, you can get Counter Strike going. You get Crimson Skies, Mech Assault, all that stuff. But I feel like the main event was always Halo, and that's the one where people were. You know, th- those are the Google searches. How do I system link? Um, you know, those are the people buying the wires that you had to hook into the other systems these are the people maybe buying the second and third xbox just so they can host the parties you know whatever this is the um reason you're going out and buying for more controllers maybe another like crt tv so you can put it up here and have another uh station to play like this is the one and i feel like it's the one that got the ball rolling um maybe future iterations of the game did it a little bit better as far as online uh or had online (laughs) existed um but this one, I think, is the perfect launching point, and I don't think you can appreciate the other ones without playing this one first. So I think it's key that you do try this when you do see, like, man, like, people just went into this blind. Like, this was really early on in the Xbox's life cycle. I think um, it was a launch game. We're very close to it. Yeah, it was launch or very close to it. Yeah, that's where I would put it. Um But, you know, you didn't, you had some hype built into it in the form of E3s and conferences, but you didn't really know what you were getting yourself into versus stuff at that time like Unreal that had multiple versions, Counter-Strike, which you could play on the computer, um, you know, sort of these other games that have had a little bit of a storied past. This one was just, it almost caught a lot of people by surprise. And like I said, it made Xbox, I feel like, that put Xbox on the map, I think, was Halo. It, so. it kept Xbox from failing, is what it sure. did, actually. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they uh, they were struggling with their, their launch and everything, and then Halo came out, and everybody's like, oh, gotta get an Xbox. Yes. There it is, yeah. Yeah. Um, number three? Yeah. Uh, the real arena shooter, the, the real good arena shooter, the best arena shooter, in my opinion, on the, on the console, and that is Unreal Championship. Uh, this had just the the epitome of the symmetrical map, the multiplayer. It actually had that um, hero shooter style thing to it, where you could be a robot which had a higher jump. Mm-hmm. You could be these like alien creatures which ran faster. You could be somebody who had more health. Um, you have your different guns. You have your sniper rifles, and they have the alternate blasts and everything. You can get really skilled shooting this alternate blast from the sniper rifle and then blasting it with a regular one to create mm. an explosion. A lot of strategy, a lot of gameplay, but th- this one really lived on the capture the flag, which is, once again, my favorite game mode. Uh, the Master is so well suited for it, so well designed for it. It had one of the most fun gun mechanics 
um, I've played ever still, which is a teleporter gun mm-hmm. where you can shoot a like teleporter disc and you can teleport to that spot. You can actually telefrag people by shooting it into somebody <laughs> yeah, yeah. and then teleporting into them. And that just made people feel real bad about themselves. Real There's bad. like what 10 a, guns in that game. I really enjoy Yeah, it. they're they're really good. That that flak cannon, that shock rifle. Oh, yeah, and if so you didn't good. like the normal version, there was like an alternate fire that you'd probably like that version of it. Yeah, so. uh, for sure. Um, just a, a real blast of a multiplayer game, and that's really what this game is. It is a multiplayer. It doesn't, I mean, it has a single player, but the single players just do the multiplayer thing against the bots, and that's yeah. what that's what keeps it from being higher up on my list, mm. personally, is there there isn't a great single player aspect to it. This is a game that you want to play with friends, with other people. Um, but the, just the strategy of shooting the, the telefrag thing down at the flag, going and capturing their flag and tele, teleporting back to it, and you might say, oh, that sounds really cheap. But if you shoot their teleport disc, it, it doesn't alert them. And when they teleport back, it instant kills them. No. Uh, so <laughs> you, you can actually destroy their teleport discs. And that, that's another way to just be like, <laughs> got you back for, for telefragging me earlier. Um, just really phenomenal. All gameplay, super fast paced, still incredibly fast paced uh, to this day. Some of the, some of the fastest gameplay. And uh, just pull, pulled everything together in this arena setting really, really, really well. Love me some Unreal. I really liked it too when you would turn on different options like low gravity. Oh and stuff yeah, like it that. had the the modifiers yeah. that you could do the insta gib. So every every shot is a one hit shot. Then you put on the low gravity, so you're like dodging the bullets mm. coming at you. When when if it touches you, you just die. Oh, uh, it was so. Great. And you f- always you always felt great running into their base, taking the flag and getting yeah. back, knowing that any shot will kill you. You just get this adrenaline rush, which there, is actually what it's called in the game. There is a clear <laughs> line of people who just started playing the game and people who lived on that game. Yeah. Like, the skill gap, it wasn't like some games where it's like, oh, he used the cheap weapon. Like, no, like, you're getting headshots. You're just crushing people. Headshot. Uh, like, there, also, there's we got to talk gap. about the announcers. The in announcers some of these games. Oh, my gosh. So good. I, I miss the days of those those announcers yeah. telling me how good I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, obviously the Halo one, very distinguishable uh, narrator, yeah. or announcer, yeah. or whatever you want to call him. The host. Um, very distinguished for Unreal. Uh, they would always use the same one, always yeah. getting up to the monster kill. Uh, monster. Like, yeah, like you said, that's kind of like something that really died out. I mean, games like Destiny have it, but you don't really yeah, remember it. Doesn't it doesn't have that impact. Um, I can't even tell you what the person sounds like or what he says. I can't even remember the last shooter game where I really felt like I had one of these guys. Like these, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know what happened to them. They all left the industry, I guess. Uh, we retired. <laughs> Them and Ninja Gaiden need to come back. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they can just announce Ninja Gaiden. That'd be cool. Uh, but yeah, my, my number three is Unreal Championship. I must play for the, the party. Unreal settings. Championship. Getting down to the meat. Number two. Uh, Halo Combat Evolved. No! No! <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. That's what he said. Unbelievable. Um, so the there were two reasons I bought an Xbox. Um, Project Gotham Racing and Halo 1. Uh, because Halo 1 was one of the first first-person shooters I really got into. Like, I had played Counter-Strike on PC and Tribes 2, but then Halo, I finally got to play Halo at somebody else's house and loved it. Um, it's one of my favorite worlds also. Like, the mm-hmm. Halo world is one of my favorite worlds to be in because that world has a lot of depth to it and I love the way they set up the Marines and the Covenant and everything. I've never read so many books about a video game as this one. I think I, I read through like seven or eight books. I read five Halo books. For, for I know for a fact I read five of them. Because uh, that universe is great and it's really well fleshed out and it all came out of this first Halo game mm-hmm. which I thought played and handled and controlled absolutely flawlessly. Um, I love that single player. I went back. I've gone through it several times. <laughs> yeah. Like several, like several, several times, and it was the first like real like land party game I ever had, and it was just a fucking blast to play, and because I and I love sticky grenades, so <laughs> probably the first game I've ever made money on with oh, all yeah. the tournaments that you and I got to do in yeah, school yeah. and other stuff that I did uh, on the side of that. I was just like, man, like is this esports? I think we there, boys. Um, Won a couple of Halo tournaments. Editors know I didn't make it into esports, but <laughs> Yikes. it was good at the time. Your hat says otherwise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yikes. Uh, yeah, one of, just one of my favorite games. One of the best on the console. 
Um, if you buy an original Xbox for the first time ever, it's something you have to have and have to play. Yeah. If you, there's something really wrong if you don't have... If you buy an Xbox and At least play a Halo. Halo. Yeah. Oh, man. Number two. What's wrong, Kevin? Nothing. Nothing at all. <laughs> Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. One. <laughs> well played. Um... I won't get into the uh, one versus two argument because that's its own episode and we quit doing unpopular opinions <laughs> a long time ago. Um, but no, like as far as um, the narrative focused game, like this one has to be the first choice, I feel like, on the system because, you know, online, Xbox Live aside, like there was also very good single player games and this was the top one for sure. Um like Kevin mentioned, every time they're talking about, oh, so-and-so is going to direct a new Star Wars series, it's just like everyone. Like the first hundred comments has to be, is it Old Republic? Yeah, they go, uh, is it Old Republic? And they go, no. And they go, please stop making Star Wars <laughs> stuff. <laughs> then shut up. Is it Old Republic? No. Is it animated? No. Okay, get out of here. <laughs> we're, we're done here. We're moving on. No, um, it's this guy that did Last Jedi. Stone uh, him. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, um, there's a reason why it's a top dog. Not only, um, you know, did they have the cool function where you are just literally choosing what they say and you get to see the people react to it and you get to do your light side, your dark side, the, everything in between. You get to extend conversations out as far as you want to or you can just skip all of them and just be like, yep, who cares, uh, whatever. Um, like it was also mentioned, the game is not about you just wake up and you're a master Jedi and you just go stab stuff. Um. yeah I'll stick to that story uh, you wake up and you kind of feel kind of clueless uh, you know what oh, you am feel I completely sort of fucking clueless <laughs> yeah. um, I'm a dude on a ship and the you build all the way up to you're the badass by the end of the game um, you get there and it's a very long journey uh, 30 hours something like that I feel like yeah, I'm doing about 25 to 30 now um, I've been through the game a couple of times and like literally it's one of those games where you defeat the guy and he drops his lightsaber or something like that or he drops his uh, the tunic or whatever he was wearing and it's better than what you had before and you feel like you are like actually climbing up not really the ranks but like you are climbing up the power level I guess and by the time you get to the end you really feel like you know you can compete with the Vaders on screen or the Skywalker or the you know whoever like you feel like you are as powerful as one of them that you're seeing in the movies and also top of all that the music's good like the typical kind of Bioware polish was really on this sort of game um on top of all that you know the game has big twists it has memorable characters that you know maybe show up in other forms or fashions of other games and stuff like that um and yeah just like any time a new star wars and it's not just limited to movies too like when they're talking about so and so company working on a new star wars project is it Old Republic 3? Um, you know, it's just, it's one of those things that there's a reason why, without going into spoiler territory or really talking too much about the game, because, you know, like I said, it's narrative focus. Um, there's a reason why every single time new Star Wars gets mentioned, it's where's the Old Republic? Uh, where's Revan, the, guy, the main uh, focus, I guess, of the game? Where's all these other side characters that people really love? Um, I'm sure you're always seeing at like Star Wars conventions, these people popping up in like cosplay sort of things. Like these are really beloved characters, the whole group, I guess, on your ship. Um, probably had the best or one of the best now that we're 2018, I guess. One of the best uh, card games inside of a video game. Uh, mm -hmm. Not really card game, but like side games that you can play. Um, oh, top 10 side games and games. Yeah. Top 10 game in a game. <laughs> uh, Really love Fazat. It's pure Fazat. Uh, it is a great game uh, within a game. But yeah, just just everything. Like it really brought the house down as far as like every category you can think of for an RPG or just video game. It is through the roof. I haven't really met anyone who has like really put some serious time in it and just been like, ah, this sucks. Like it either hooks you in from the start and you're 30 hours in, or you're just like, this isn't my style of game, but I can. I guess I can see the buzz about it, I guess. So number two on the list, but number one of the franchise, I guess. So, All right. We're driving the ship. 
and it was doing pretty well. Uh, it started sinking a little <laughs> bit, so I'm going to patch up some holes here. Uh, number two is Halo 2, the correct Halo to have on the list. Um, it has an, it, it, the reason that I have it higher than Unreal, as I said, is while I like Unreal's multiplayer better and Halo's multiplayer is phenomenal still, um, particularly in the level design category, um, not a, there is some symmetrical levels, but, uh, it had a variety of, of both in, in this particular, uh, category, but Halo 2's story, the epic moments, the set pieces of the story, the controls are more refined than Halo, and they are sig- actually significantly better. They added uh, to the the gameplay of Halo 1 and the the weapon loadout and such in such a good way, and it. I I'm very disappointed that you guys both picked one. I'm actually very surprised. You I'm not surprised with. You always pick the the one I don't I wouldn't pick. But <laughs> Kellen, I'm actually very shocked that you. you oh, I changed it when we sat one. down because I couldn't. I like you both couldn't of them decide. Like I mean, to be fair, this will probably put both of them on the list, which I'm is okay probably correct. Um, I'm just shocked uh, actually that you, that you you picked that one in particular. I have, I have more fond memories of the first one. That's fine. That's fine. Um, but yeah, Halo 2, it introduced the Arbiter. Um, there's moments, you brought up the music when you were talking yep. about Halo 1, and I thought of the do 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 and instantly I thought of the bridge, going over the bridge yep. with the, the scarab, and every, oh gosh, uh, what a great, memorable, single player experience that you have, uh, in that particular journey. And then you hop over to the, the phenomenal multiplayer, the gunplay is great, the, the capture the flag. <laughs> the is capture the flag is uh, one of the only games that has vehicles that I love. That does them really well. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, the vehicles feel fair and balanced. Uh, the you know the rocket launcher will just straight shoot out this it this just, banshee it just if you blows it if you try to do it. Like everything that they show you, you can be like, well, that's overpowered, but it has a good counter in mm-hmm. some way. The gameplay mechanic of power weapons. Um, here's a sword. There's one sword on the map. The game heavily revolves around that sword knowing who has it where it is yeah. protecting them um picking it up when whenever it's dropped like i i loved their their the way that that multiplayer in particular um um worked easily and, uh at the time probably even still to this day as far as console multiplayer goes probably the like most pristine quality all around i think multiplayer that i can think of and sort of like you mentioned when we're talking about halo um, in the same kind of vein that I was talking about SWOTOR or uh, KOTOR in any time, whether it's Halo 4 or 5, the next one that they make, if they do a map pack, everyone instantly goes, are any of the Halo 2 maps in there? That's true. Um, lockout, Blackout, you know, whatever they end up calling the same template of that map. It's always, where's the Halo 2 map? So, yeah. Yeah, so, anyway... Halo 2, I think a step above the original in every single way. But uh, except I'm, the pistol, I'm glad. Except the Dude, pistol. The pi- that's not fun. <laughs> it is fun. Busted. <laughs> it's fun if you're good with it. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, bad, bad gameplay. <laughs> no, no. Anyway, no. Halo 2. I'm glad somebody can represent the correct side of the the universe. Yeah, there's over two. Here. <laughs> uh, Kellen, what possibly could be? Your number one game. Here comes on the big twist, list. boys. It does have a big twist. <laughs> uh, my favorite game of all time happens to be on Xbox. It's Star Wars: Knights of the Old Republic. Um, I think it's one of, if not the first RPG I ever played. And I was just like, "What the fuck is all this slow ass?" God, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> it just like snapped. Like I played it for a day or two, and it just like snapped. Like I, I want to do this forever. <laughs> Um, like I didn't play it when it released because I, I didn't even know what it was. Like somebody was like, "Here's the game, here's the book. Shut up and go play this." I'm like, "Okay, fuck it, I'll try it." Um, but I absolutely love that game. Like I literally was talking about Mission Viator at work this week. Like I still talk about yeah. this game all the time. Characters are great. One of my favorite casts of anything, game wise. My one of my favorite protagonists of anything. The villain's excellent. Like just everything in this game is extremely well done. I think. Um, my favorite bioware game like it's just it checks all the all the boxes for an rpg um it u- uses some systems that some people are turned off by like it's it is turn based but it's extremely fast paced turn based all the combat's actually based on dice rolls yeah. like it's based on like a star wars like kind of dungeons and dragons game 
Um, the side the side quests and stories are some of the best in any game. Like you can talk to some of the characters to the point where they literally can like change classes, and you don't even know that unless you get to them. Um, it has like the goofy DLC where you find like the station. The guy just like makes stuff for you on the station. Um, I just one of my favorite games, and if you have an Xbox, you should almost certainly play it, unless you've already played it, I guess. But even then, play it anyway. Play it, play it again. Who cares? Uh, I play it every year because it's my favorite game, yep. so I run through it. You do. Um, it's. I wouldn't change anything about that game. It has one of the best side characters ever that hadn't been mentioned yet, sadly. HK forty seven. Uh, like it just it does everything really well. All the all the planets are laid out extremely well. They all feel like, incredibly different because they are they're different yeah. planets. The the going back and forth between the planets is really smooth and seamless because the ship's cool. You spend time on the ship too. Like there's nobody you want to leave behind except fucking cars, but that's a whole <laughs> other thing. Uh, like I uh, just absolutely love that game. One of my favorite just, game ever. Just the fact that you get to make your own lightsaber is just like, oh, y- that's your, so good. Your first lightsaber is like 10 fucking hours in if it's your first playthrough. It takes you forever to get there. They make you train and do all this shit. And mm. You finally get to build the damn thing. Like, thank God. But yeah, with like HK, like that's the thing right now in Star Wars movies is make the cool, witty uh, robot or droid that is part of the crew. That that stemmed from this one, like yeah, there's there's C three PO that had you know a little bit of humor. R two D two you assume uh, is witty, but he just uh, beeps and boops. I don't uh, speak that. But uh, <laughs> but H K is the premier uh, awesome droid. He just uh, like catches these movies you, tried to do it. Catches you off guard when he first starts talking. You're just like, why does he say meat bags? <laughs> you're just like, what's up with this thing? Look how he's just excellent in every way. You can upgrade him and you'll unlock more of his memories. Like, he's got his own story. Mm-hmm. Uh, the game's awesome. Uh, I've ever told you about the copy that I borrowed with the magazine that it had a point in the game it would always freeze. So the first time I played it, I didn't actually get to finish it. <laughs> but the point That's happened in a couple of Bioware games. <laughs> uh, we won't talk about the other one. But the point where it would freeze was right after the big reveal. Yeah. Like, yeah, I had already done, like, three of the main four planets. <laughs> and literally, you would do like this little thing in space where you'd shoot down the ships and it would just crash. I was <laughs> It's sort of like a mic drop, like, here's the big surprise. And you, then you, you, would, you would learn the thing, you would go for five more minutes and somebody would ask you a question and it would freeze. Like, you <laughs> fucking got to be kidding me. I love how old games did that. The, God uh, of War uh, 1 did that. Uh, and it's like a known issue if you played on an original PlayStation 2 when you yeah. get to the final boss fight. That you like lock up in a quick time event, and then the game just locks up. <laughs> <laughs> it just doesn't work. It, it anymore. literally, you would like click the button to respond to the person, and it just would sit there. If you even got that far, sometimes you wouldn't even get to that. It was just <laughs> one of those two points. I had to literally go find a different copy of the game to be able to finish it. Like, I had to finally buy the, it for uh, myself. The system couldn't handle the big it uh, narrative twist. It like, couldn't oh take it. <laughs> uh, I love that game. So, Kotor. Nick, what is your. What could possibly number be one? number one? Um, I, I don't know. I'm excited to find out. Jet Set Radio Future. Not what I thought it was going to be. It is I knew it was here one somewhere. of the most me games that I can think of, which it doesn't really, like. I guess appearance-wise, I don't really match a Jet Set player. But, um, I mean, you kind of do. Is that why you laughed when I didn't put it on the table and I put it back? Oh, uh-uh. <laughs> no, that, was, that was him. That was, that that was, was me that laughed. Because I knew it was one of Nick's top two um, or three easily. I could talk about this game for far too long, but... Um, the big thing that gets me is like this is like Sega, I guess, at its premiere. This is no, that video. Was Sonic. G- <laughs> Yikes! Um, this is one of the one of the more, at least at the time, more outrageous type of games. But it was just, I guess, if I had to like give it a phrase, it was just so damn cool to skate around and just. Screw around with the city. It was cool to just graffiti everything. It felt really awesome. It felt really like you were, I guess, part of this little cool resistance uh, sort of thing, but it wasn't like heavy in a first person shooter kind of story. It was really light. Um, the enemies were just outrageous and stupid and crazy and cool. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the music, uh, it's always going to come back to the music with this game. That's like the spine of the game, even with uh, Jet Grind Radio. Um, the music in this game is just so different from a lot of things at the time. You don't play a lot of Xbox games with like J-pop and like some weird like <laughs> alternative stuff, going, like just some really weird mixtures of music. And it just felt really 
urban and cool and it just it was really it was just different from all these other games like i said it was a system overloaded with some action rpgs some uh, arena this some um, first person that like it was just its own thing it stood out and it had a very very like very deep gameplay in the fact that you could unlock all these characters you could get like a hundred hours into the game and still be unlocking stuff in different little battle modes you could play with your friends uh in more of like a couch co-op t- type of scenario clearing the levels like you could obviously just clear the stage and move on to the next city but then you also could come back and there's not really like collectibles but there's just different avenues of things you could complete and all of these tags that you could do uh it's just a really really deep game and like I said, it always comes back to the style of game, the cell shaded, which is pretty much timeless. I mean, there's yeah. um, you can still do HD remixes and make it look better, but like these games still hold up to the games of today, just because that art style is just uh, it's almost like lifeless. It, it ages well. It's yeah. just because just, just, it doesn't age much. Yeah, it, you don't have to worry about how you know silly some things look uh, going back ten years in that style, but just the whole personality of that game. It was just right there in your face the whole time. It was really fleshed out, colorful, um, and just everything clicked in that game. And I feel like it went so far um, over and beyond anything I could have expected for, like, if you just say, oh, yeah, you just kind of skate around and tag step. It's like, oh, like Tony Hawk is like, eh, no, not, not really. Quite. Here, just try it. And you just, you hear the catchy song, you're bobbing your head, and you're doing the cool little moves uh, Well, you know, guys are chasing you or enemies are attacking and it's a different sort of like combat system it's not punch and shoot and stuff it's like its own little thing um so it's just really cool and like i said it's kind of a culture shock whether you're talking about just like u.s guy playing that type of game or even like an xbox guy playing that type of game it's just its own little thing and it stole the show for me and i don't know where it falls in my top games of all time but i definitely think it would be in the top 10 somewhere, at least a talking point in there. Like it's, it is a, I have very fond memories of the game and yeah, that's where I'm at. Where's my, uh, where's my sequel? That would be cool. Interesting. I did not expect that actually. Um, time for my number one. Now I actually had two games kind of fighting for this spot. Um, they were both from the same franchise, so I could not have both of them on the list. I think one has a better multiplayer with a worse single player, and one has a vastly better single player with still a great multiplayer. So that's the one that I went with. Uh, And mine is Splinter Cell Chaos Theory. Um, I'll start with the single player, a a darker kind of tone to the the already dark stories of uh, Sam Fisher. But it also changed it from the, oh, you, you get caught, game over, do it again. Uh, that repetitive nature that a yeah. lot of stealth games had. And it added in uh, way more varieties in just the gameplay. The ability to kind of fight your way out of a situation if you screwed up. You're not, it doesn't feel like um, you're playing the AI, basically. Which is how a lot of stealth games, especially back then, seem to feel. You're like, okay, he does this, then he does this, then he does this, let me figure it out. All right, next one, he does this, he does this, let me figure it out. This let you kind of play the way that you wanted to play. On top of that, it added on to Pandora Tomorrow's awesome multiplayer, um, which is a 2v2 multiplayer where one team is a first-person mer- mercenary team, the other team is a third-person Sp- spy Spies team. versus mercs. And uh, it is actually my favorite uh, multiplayer that I have played still to this day. Um, Unreal is my favorite arena multiplayer, but this is my favorite multiplayer. Oh. I really, really like it. Uh, the gameplay is basically capture the flag. You're trying to you're trying to find these vials. Uh, there's an A point and a B point, and you don't know which one the spies are going to go for. If they capture either of them and bring them back to their their camp, they win. Uh, but the mercenaries are equipped with guns and gadgets and things like that to to take them out, whereas the spies have the ability to kind of hack things, Mm -hmm. shoot out uh, cameras, uh, make it dark so that the opponent can't see. They can put them to sleep, and then your teammate has to run and, like, wake you up when you when you uh, One of the uh, uh, smartest so forms of, like, cops and robbers, basically. Yeah, that, that's what it is. Um, it is so good. And then I know that online isn't as uh, big of a, you know, you can't play it online, so it's a little weird, but... 
having the voice chat online was so cool because there was items as a spy where you could shoot the mercs with chips where you could hear into their conversations, uh, which was just something super unique for the time and uh, ruined by party chat, <laughs> unfortunately. Well, also, yeah, it made the best use of proximity chat because so many times as a spy, I would sneak up and right before you're about to like break their neck or something, like, gotcha, bitch, and then yeah. like, just kill them. <laughs> so. it, it, felt so, it felt so good. Uh, yeah, you can, you can when you grabbed somebody, yeah. you could hold them hostage and you could talk to them while they're hostage and be like, where's your, if you tell me where your teammate is, I won't kill you. I'll just knock you out. And you'd be like, oh, he's here. Okay, crack. <laughs> it was oh. so good. Um, <laughs> a- absolute blast. Uh, just the, the full total package of single player, multiplayer, and everything. If you can get a, a group together with four Xboxes, all with your own TVs in particular, and even better if you can get some sort of voice chat thing going. It's mm-hmm. uh, so Splinter Cell, Chaos Theory, though. Once again, Pandora Tomorrow, also very good. So, tallying some stuff up, we have just a couple tiebreakers to break. Um, one of them is going to be kind of massive. The other one, I, I could see how this goes. <laughs> but uh, so for the first tiebreaker, we have a three-way tie between Ooh. Mech Assault, Jet Set Radio Future, and uh, Splinter Cell. So those are obviously all one of three these, of them are making make the list. Okay. So you just got to order them. So I'll, I'll kind of go first and say I would say Mech Assault goes up top as multiple people had Mech Assault on the list. Um, and then obviously I'd put Splinter Cell above Jet Set because that was my thing. That's going to just be Kellen breaking that particular one. But that that's how I oh. would rank them. Uh, Nick, what do you think? Um, I would put, I'm trying to think more objectively, even though it's me uh, saying mm. this. Um, I would say only okay. because Kotor too. <laughs> Jet Set was exclusive and Splinter Cell wasn't. That's my only... Splinter Cell technically was for a little bit. For, for how long? long? Um, but that's my only objective dog in that fight, I guess. I I would agree, uh, and I think we'd try and do this more often than not. If multiple people put it in their list, that obviously means that as a collective unit of Press X podcast people, more of us would... Um, suggest that game and truth be told i played a shit ton of mech assault so i am not gonna hate on that game whatsoever so i'm fine with that if all three are making the list i'd say definitely mech assault first and he pitched a splinter cell above jet set i pitched my jet set above splinter cell up to you uh well jet set was my number 11 so mech assault jet set yeah so interesting like it, it almost made it it was an honorable mention that game was just fucking awesome. My number 11 was uh, Chronicles. I was between uh, Chronicles really? okay, and, cool. and uh, um, Suffering. I don't know if it was number 11, but to tie up kind of the trio of Crimson Skies and Mech Assault, there was a game called Blood Wake, which was oh, a yeah, the boat. ship. <laughs> yes. yeah. So it was ship, robot, and plane. And that was the Land trio AMC. of... Um, pick any type of vehicle you want this one has its own personality when you get shot by it, you know exactly what it is controls were awesome um that was the one that didn't make it for me which i don't think it would have made our top 10 anyway where i would have put it but uh definitely not one to overlook if you like uno and dose of the trio you would definitely like blood weight yeah left off jet set left off moto gp the next tiebreak that we need to <laughs> break is so four games, on. only two of them make the list. Okay. So this oh. is an elimination between Project Gotham Racing, uh, Silent Hill 4, The Rune, Chronicles, A Verdict, and Burnout 3 is the, are the ones Oof. fighting. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so for me, I would rank them... Um, those are like three of my most played yeah. Xbox I, games. Yeah, one, I of those, would rank them, one of those is in my top five. Like, uh, yeah. For the top, I'd put Silent Hill, obviously. Um, <laughs> next, I would put Chronicles, as I said, it was my my next one. Then I would put Burnout, and then finally I'd put Project Gotham. Oh, have fun. <laughs> um, I will say that Chronicles was what number three, number four for me. Number four. That's where Burnout was yes. on mine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So it's, it's Silent Hill was it's on my so checks top. out. No, no, no. no. Um, it's got to be my top choice, at least by, you know, just the way we usually handle these. So that's got to be my number one from this list. Um, 
Project Gotham. Who this is sounding like I'm saying it's better than Burnout, but it's, uh, I'm not getting into that fight. Um, I Lord. also listed Project Gotham, so I've got to put it on there. And then the two that I didn't list, Burnout, then Silent Hill. Um, okay, Kellen? Well, Burnout was my number four, so i got to put it number one. Um... I want Riddick to make the list. I think do, it like, do it by what you think. Okay. Two games will make it. Uh, then PGR, because it was number six on my list. They were both on there. Then Riddick third, and then whatever your room game is. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> whatever your room game is. It's a Silent Hill. It actually sounds like a game I want Nick to play. No. Damn it. It's not ever going to happen. Okay, if my math is correct, oh God, which it probably isn't because I kind of thought of doing this halfway through, <laughs> Chronicles would be the top choice. Fair. Okay. And then Burnout would edge out Project Gotham. I can Fair. live with that. Yeah, that's okay. how it kind of is on that's my list. That's okay. okay. Yeah. Like I said, we haven't done racing games yet, but... Good uh, God, man. <laughs> the, the game would make the list, spoiler alert, so... I hope I did that right. If not, that's okay, because we all at least agree. And yeah. I, I don't hate Silent Hill not being on the list, because Silent Hill is such a PlayStation-based franchise, so I'm not going to argue Well, that too, game. if you want to look at it, if it eases everyone else's conscience, too, Burnout, prob- that's easily the best one of the series. Project Gotham, it's arguable that that one's the best one. of Chronicles the- of Riddick Escape from Butcher Bay, probably the best of the, the Ooh. series. They had that Dark Athena one, though. Mm. Isn't that just DLC? Yeah, but... <laughs> 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 All right. Multiple, oh, multiple Excellent versions. DLC. It was more than just like, hey, here's a mission. Like I said, at this time when they did actual expansions of the game, it felt like an actual like chunk of a new game versus... I think that's what I was saying about Ninja Gaiden in black. But. All right, so we have our list. We ready? Yeah. Sure. Number 10, Burnout 3. Number nine, Chronicles of Riddick, Escape from Butcher Bay. Number eight, <laughs> Unreal Championship. Number seven, Halo 2. Number six, Splinter Cell, Chaos Theory. Number five, Jet Set Radio Future. Number four, Mech Assault. Number three, Fable the Lost Chapters. Number two, Halo 1, Combat Evolved. And number one, Knights of the Old Republic. Go to I got the top three on that. <laughs> <laughs> I heavily assumed that something like that uh, would happen. But like I said, I'm not mad. That's a totally fine list. You can find uh, all 10 of these games on my uh, shelf at home. <laughs> Still, <laughs> Yeah, that Fair is enough. a totally fine. In fact, I think I have all of them over there except for Riddick. And Riddick is yeah. one that I want. I just don't yeah. have. I have the demo disc for Riddick over there. Fair enough. Was, uh, oh, yeah. Um, time when demo discs were Or if alive. you have Halo, R- we can one play of the, the top demo discs out, ever, I think. Riddick. Really good demo. Mm. Yeah. Um, how do we, how do we feel about the list overall? Feeling good? Immaculate. Yeah, I love it. All right. My favorite. So those are our recommendations for Xbox. Uh, go check out all of our other lists that we've done for other consoles and more to come in the future, of course. Thank you for ranking these. Kellen. Anytime it's Xbox, I'll do it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for ranking these, Nick. I want to go home and play Xbox now. <laughs> and thank you guys so much for watching. We will speak with you next time.